This is episode 113 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Welcome to episode 113 of the Andrew Hines Real Estate Investing Podcast. Today, I have Jared and Krista Hope on the show. They are some very impressive real estate investors and another set of guests from the Western provinces. Jared and Krista live in British Columbia and they're investing in Alberta, primarily in Edmonton. And their portfolio consists of primarily suited dwellings. So they have over 100 properties now and uh, they've been in it since 2003. So another battle-tested real estate investor couple that has seen the ups and the downs and they know how to deal with recessions and come through them. So don't forget back in 2008, what happened in the Alberta real estate market. And then again, in 2016, they've come through both of them and they share the wisdom that they've learned along the way. And this is really important because if you're in Ontario, everybody thinks it's all roses and it's always been all roses. Uh, well, it's not. We've we've had a lot of people that have been made to look really smart because the market has constantly saved us. I'm no exception there. The market has certainly helped me in a lot of circumstances when I've done renos that have gone over budget. So it's great to see the philosophy here, the thought process, and a lot of what I've experienced has led me to the same conclusions that you want to have a bit of equity built into your deals and or you want to have a lot of cash flow so that you have a buffer if things change, if rents change that you're still going to be OK holding that property, even if it does, in fact, go, quote unquote, below water, meaning that your value goes less than your mortgage. So no one wants to be in that scenario. But if we have cash flow, we'd be willing to wait it out. Both Jared and Krista are very bullish on the Alberta market. They see a lot of opportunity there, and I can certainly see where they're coming from with those comments. And I personally do know investors that are headed out that way right now because they see the opportunity as well. So it was a really interesting conversation. We got very high level in this conversation about growth, about mindset, what it takes to be the type of person that has a $10 million plus net worth, all the things that go into that and the different experiences that both Jared and Krista have had that have led them to this point. So I really liked it and I think you're going to like it too. As always, if you're new to this or if the terminology we're using is new to you and you're not quite following, I highly recommend you go right back to episode one and start working your way through. This podcast started in 2019 and the information is all still relevant today. And if you wouldn't mind, please take a moment and rate and review this podcast on Apple Podcasts. Give it a five star. Let people know what you think. It will really help this to get into the hands of more people. So hopefully it can help them as well. And then of course, if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you hit the like and subscribe and notification bell if you have not already done so just to help other people find this video as well. So thank you so much for your constant support and without further ado please enjoy episode 113 with jared and krista hope hello and welcome to the andrew hines real estate investing podcast i have jared hope and krista you also go by hope yes or, that's right. okay yeah. jared and krista yeah. hope on the podcast and uh they're going to talk to us about all kinds of things i know you guys are doing quite a bit of real estate out in the edmonton area so rather than me try and uh tell people what it is why don't you go ahead uh, either jared or krista let me know uh, do you want to go first, sweetheart? No, you go, no. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, thanks for having us, man. Like, this is awesome. Uh, so we, we own uh, a lot of real estate out in Alberta. We've transacted over 500 properties since 2003. And we started, we bought our first property in 2003. And, you know, since then we've almost gone bankrupt. We've almost been divorced. We restructure our business. We've now we have a property management company, which is called Tilt Property Group. And now we specialize in legally suited conversions out in Edmonton as well. We live in Kelowna, but we invest in, uh, in the Alberta market. And that's, that's kind of a quick little snapshot of what we've done in real estate. Yeah, the, the legally suited thing, I, I've seen this a fair bit from, you know, for Edmonton product that uh, there's a lot of new construction suited units being built. So there's houses with suite, with a suite in the basement. And that's, that's pretty common. I know Ontario investors are buying into that a lot. They'll, they'll get like three houses side by side. So they have six units finance it all commercially. Yeah. Are you seeing that kind of thing out there? Yeah. And like people need to understand like Edmonton's different than, you know, Alberta's different than say, you know, Vancouver or Ontario, the GTA. And, you know, these new builds that are being built, they're beautiful, but they're one bedrooms. And the one bedrooms are four or 500 square feet. That just does not work in Alberta. And, you know, they're hard to rent. You get lower rent or higher turnover because in Alberta, people have the big trucks and the quads and the bikes and all this other stuff where they want, they want room. 
and especially with what's happening in COVID, but like we just don't have the density that Toronto and Vancouver have, for example. So the suited houses are, they started coming into the scene about 2010. And I might've been one of the first in Edmonton to do them in, in mass volumes. And, but now we're starting to see more and more of these legally converted conversions happening um, in, in all over Canada. It's a great product. Okay. And what are you, like, what's your angle on this? How are you profiting in this? Are you doing burrs? Are you investing investor funds or is it a combination of the two? Yeah. So I don't, I don't like burrs are great, but burrs don't really work in the Alberta market just because with a burr, you have to have the forced appreciation. So if you buy a house for, you know, 400 grand and you do nothing to it down the road, it's going to be 420. A burr is going to work there. Whereas in Alberta, you know, the market's kind of flat. It's only going up 2%, 2.5%. Two it might go down 2% over, the, over that six month span. So burrs are really tough right now, especially if you're not doing the work. A lot of people who do burrs will outsource it. So if you're outsourcing it, all that saving is going to be absorbed or taken up by a contractor. So what we do is we own over 100 properties and close to 150 plus doors. And our strategy now is, you know, back in the day I was buying single, we were buying single family homes. And, you know, Krista can talk about her experience on, on the cash flow from those. But we were buying single family homes that by 2008 just weren't profitable. And come 2010, we restructured our portfolio to more suited houses. And the benefit to the suited houses was you get two for the price of one, two units for the price of one, one's vacant, one's rented. You're always break even, worst case scenario. So in 2010, we started doing turnkey properties. So we'll buy the house, we'll renovate it, fully renovate it, and then we'll turn around and sell it. When we sell it, it's rented, we offer warranty, and we offer uh, free tenant placement, and we have property management systems in place. So that's how that's our strategy. I'm done buying. I'm done doing buy and holds. And the reason why is like our finish line is like right there. You know, we started back in 2003, and, you know, we have a plan to be out in the next five to eight years. And so we're done acquiring. I don't need any more properties. You know, I, I don't, I think I have too many as it is. Yeah. So, I mean, there's a couple of follow-up questions I have here. Is your portfolio like all you need to retire on? You have the cash flow there that you, you need and want to, to have the retirement you have envisioned, or is there more to do, um, you know, even if it's not acquiring more properties? Um, what, what do you think, Chris? This, this, this goes to the um, question that this goes to the question that we had conversation we were having earlier, Chris and I, you know, as I'm walking down to do the podcast, I'm like, let's go fucking rock this. And Chris is like, uh, we, I swear. So I hope that's okay. That's all right. But Chris, Chris is like, let's go change some fucking lives. You know, so our, our mission's a little bit different now. It's not about acquiring real estate because we have enough. Now it's about helping others mm-hmm. have the success that we have in real estate without having a hundred properties you don't need 100 properties to have happiness right chris yeah i would say we we still want to be doing things that create cash flow that isn't off of our real estate right now um yeah our buy and hold could do fine for us for the rest of our lives once we're ready to sell it um but you know we're we're way too young to camp out and do nothing so we're just doing things we love right now and the reality is, sorry, and the reality is, like, we're, I'm 43 and Chris is 42. And, you know, like, if you build a real estate portfolio like we have, like, we're drivers, we're type A personalities. Like, we're not going to pitch a tent in the backyard and, you know, and go, go lay on a beach for the next 10, 15, 30 years, right? So there's always going to be something. Um, and right now, that's something for us is helping other people achieve the result of financial freedom, whatever that is for them without sacrificing their relationship with self and with other um, along the way. Because the truth is you don't need a hundred properties to be wealthy and to be happy. You can do that with 10 if you play the game right. So yeah, that is, that is possible out there. 10 properties, people could be uh, financially free. Guaranteed it is, you know, but, but, but it won't happen overnight. Like there's, you know, like we're big on balance and structure and we have two young kids. Well, they're not young anymore, I guess. Still, they're still young, but they're 15 and 13. And I remember building this business when they were little kids and we work with lots of clients who have little kids. And one of them is typically disconnected from the family because they're out building this business. They're working a full-time job and then they go build the business after hours. 
that's not happiness, man. You can have all the money in the world. I could have all the money in the world, but I'd rather have my time back with my kids. That's what I've realized now when my kids are older, where, you know, I look at how we built our business and, you know, once again, Krista will have her view of it. I was, she went into mom mode. I went into protect my family and build for, for the family mode. And I worked, 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 and she stayed at home. And that's what, that's when things start disconnecting without ever knowing. And it doesn't show up until years and years later. That's why our coaching, that's why we came up with this coaching concept, the coaching program, because Chris and I, we, sh we share this, these different views of, you know, here's her views, here's my views, and here's the lessons that we learned to stay together as a couple. Because this business can be hard if you play it wrong. And not just the game of buying real estate, but also the game of being in love and having a family. Yeah, that's um, interesting. It, Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I want to hear your take well, here. Well, something that's funny in there, Jared said, I stayed at home. The funny thing about that is, I, I guess you could say I stayed at home because we didn't have a nanny. Um, we didn't have babysitters, anything like that. But I still worked the business full time back then. And but I didn't have childcare. So, you know, one of the things we would do differently, probably to try not to do so much in those years. Yeah, I can, I can really resonate with that. Cause I find, you know, I started out and I really wanted to keep simple and I would, you know, I do a couple of flips, a couple of burrs and I could manage sort of the admin I had. And, and as I've grown, there are certain things that I haven't wanted to relinquish control of, which I find stresses my life. And I actually find that now I enjoy less of my day to day than I used to, because I'm so caught up in like, in the growth and the, in the demands of the mm. business. And I, the reason I tell you this is I want to actually know what you did as you've, you've progressed to sort of delegate some of those tasks that I know when you're early in your business, you want to hold on to, how did you delegate them and trust others to, to handle them and do them well? I listen, I listen to my wife. That's, <laughs> you know, cause like the, the reality is I, I probably wasn't much different than you are you know, cause it was like, I, I didn't want to hire someone to do it. Cause I, like, they weren't going to do it as good. They weren't going to do it as fast. And I still struggle with this to this day. And we have, you know, 20 some odd people who work for us and, and it's really hard to pass stuff off mm -hmm. that at that point in time, it was really hard for me to pass stuff off because I was still so focused on trying to control everything. And it wasn't until Krista, we're, Krista was essentially the controller of the company. We we're trying to transition her out. Because what she was doing, she was, she was a full-time mom and that's a full, like that's, that's, that's a full-time job in itself. And that's a job that doesn't stop at eight or at five o'clock at night. So plus she was doing the books, plus she had a, a, a massage studio that she was, she owned and had staff work for. So we had to transition all this stuff out. It wasn't until we started hiring, I, I guess, our controller when we officially went to move Krista out where we hired this controller and that was a total mind fuck for me. Whereas Krista was like, no, we have to hire these. We have to bring in good quality people. Mm -hmm. well, well, and it was, it was the pay. I think that was the real, <laughs> the, the real hurdle for Jared to get over yeah. because you, you know, essentially in a way it seemed like it was for free because it was me doing it. But so then to suddenly have a, a large salary. Um, but every time we've made those choices, they're always hard but they always elevate us and the company and it always expands the, the growth mm -hmm. and the wealth of the company making those well, choices. Yeah, but not only that, it expands me, you know, like mm -hmm. we, we hired Dennis, we take this pressure off of you. It actually expanded both of us. It, it, it just expanded us to a whole new way of being. And when we hired Dennis, which was our first high level employee, if you will, um, manager position, like that was another, it, it, it changed our relationship because I wasn't always going to Krista about my ideas, my concepts, and I want to do this. And I want to do this because we had different ways of viewing the business as well. She had her way and I had my way. And it was really hard us running the business in parallel because we both had different feelings and wants and ideas on how to do it. So bringing in Dennis as my new person, kind of took the pressure off of Krista, moved her into my wife position, still as an owner of the company, but now we became more aligned as, as a couple, but also took the business and really expanded the business faster. Probably you, maybe you disagree with this, Krista, but it, I feel it expanded our business faster than if Krista stayed in that business. 
<laughs> and it, this is not this has nothing to do with Kristen not doing a great job. It's just the dynamics mm-hmm. of the of the whole process. Like something had to give. And the next thing that g- gave a little later on is I got out of the business and we replaced me with somebody else, a, uh, uh, a chief operating officer who now stewards the business and works with the controller and then reports to me for business decisions. Yeah. This is, but it was I, hard. I, it was really hard, man. I think that, that the key differentiation, cause I've been mulling this over a lot is how much time do you get to spend being a visionary for your business versus how much time you spend being transactional in your business. And for me, I've, I've had to be very introspective of recently how I feel that I'm more transactional in my business and, uh, I hate that like that to me, that's not mm-hmm. fulfilling. I love the visionary part, figuring the next idea. And, and I, so when you said that it allowed you to expand in your business, I mean, that to me makes perfect sense. I don't know if you'd agree with how I just put that. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And that's, that's e-myth 101. I don't know if you've mm-hmm. followed that. Yeah. I mean, you can only make so many pies yourself. So, um, yeah yeah. And it, and it, yeah 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 and it depends i mean it, it comes down to the what's your passion like if you love some like right now jared's jared's loving running our rental on our house and and so the 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 doing of that he's not swinging a hammer but he's loving interacting with the guys and stuff so part of it is what fulfills you and jazzes you up about your day and and makes you more productive because you're loving what you're doing yeah, I think that's so critical, right? Like the things you procrastinate on. I, I just finished getting through Who Not How, which actually kind of goes against what e Revisited said. Ah. And I, I don't know, have you read that book? No, I agree. Not one book is right. And there's yeah. no like, mm-hmm. there's there's no truth is. That's the funny thing. We have a podcast called The Truth Is, but there is no truth is. So yeah. the e isn't right necessarily. And it's it all comes down to what yeah. do you want and love. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. This, this was the point I was trying to make though. Uh, the, the, it's wisdom. Your procrastination is wisdom. Like if you're procrastinating on something, it's, it's, oh, yeah. it's your inner wisdom trying to tell you this isn't the right thing for you to be doing. So you need to find somebody right. that'll do it. And so true. And, uh, but, but, it, but, it, but in saying that dude, like I, I totally agree with you, but it's all about creating the systems and the structure for that person you come into to win and feel supported, which takes the pressure off you of thinking about it. Like, you know, for example, I do all the sales for our company and, you know, to this day, we, we manage 600 rental properties. Uh, we do 15 renovations, flips a year, uh, our coaching did all 100% of the sales flow through me. I have a realtor division, all the leads, I deal with everything. And I've often talk to Carla and some of, and other people on my team about, you know, do I want to get out of that? The answer is no, I love it. I love talking to people. I, could I go hire someone for 60, 50, $60,000 a year to do my sales? Absolutely. Would it, would it be the best return on my invest, my time? I don't know. Cause I really get, I, I get a charge. I get a buzz out of talking to people and helping people. So that lights me up. What I don't get a buzz and charge out of is creating a policy. Or, 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 you know, or, or uh, doing a check on a policy or making sure a system works or following up with people and mm-hmm. checking on like doing staff meetings, like that stuff just blows my, I don't have time for that stuff. Yeah. So there are certain things in my business that I just love doing and I still do them. And the other, the other stuff that I, it's just not a fuck. Yeah. I've hired yeah. people to do that. Yeah. You got to delegate that other stuff out there. And that, that's something I've admittedly uh, struggled with. So, so the, the interesting differentiation, so is that the whole e-myth revisited for anyone who hasn't read that, I recommend reading it. I think it's a good book. Um, but the, the idea in that book is like you basically make everything so detail oriented, you create procedures for each task so that it couldn't be screwed up. And it's not really about who you hire. It's, you know, anybody should be able to do it if you give them the procedural manual. And then the other side of that, which I found really interesting, but some of the things still jive is the who not how model, which is a pretty new book. And I would definitely recommend if you guys haven't checked it out, check it out. But uh, that one's more about being the visionary and kind of explaining the vision and then letting somebody else figure out the how. And I think there's pros and cons. The only thing I worry about with that is if they leave, then they've taken the intellectual property with them. I I can tell you firsthand, we can tell you firsthand, the who, the who, not how might not work. It didn't work for us. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the truth is they, I feel 
my truth is that they need some kind of structure for them to go into. Yeah. And like, if I go hire somebody, I don't have to have every detailed policy ironed out. If you hire uneducated people, unsophisticated people for cheap, because that's what most people try to do. They try to get someone for dirt cheap and expect grand things. That, that's an imbalance. It doesn't work. Mm -hmm. How do I know we tried that? And so if you, if they come in with some structure, you know, like maybe 60%, 70% structure, they, if you hire the right people, they can take it the distance and tweak things. And you just have to, you know, like what I've learned over the years is you have to allow people one to make mistakes, learn as they go, keep on coaching and supporting them, keep on giving them love and never put them into a position where they feel like they're messing up. Cause if they ever feel like they're messing up, they'll never come to you with a problem. You want to be super presentable or, or approachable to be able to fix this stuff. And, you know, like I, I believe more in the, the right person in the right seat versus the wrong person in the wrong seat or the wrong person in the right seat. So you want to make sure that you're hiring the right person for the right job. That's going to be able to take the distance. Most people don't hire the right people for the right job. They try to force them into the, into the peg. They try to force a square into a round peg and it doesn't work. We, we've, we've dealt with this problem multiple times. So we, we are going to have quite a few people who are thinking about growing or kind of getting to that point where they're ready to hire some help. It might be their first hire. How do they make sure they hire the right person? I mean, for me, it would be an admin, like absolutely be an admin, somebody working my inbox, doing everything, being me more or less. Mm -hmm. How do I hire the right person in that job? Krista, <laughs> don't, don't, don't let me hire him. I always hire bad. So that's not true at all. Um, there's so many ways to look at this. There's so many perspectives and, and it's hard for me to say like concisely, this, this is how it is. I think it has to be somebody you jive with and that you can communicate well with ideally somebody that, that is going to ask for help if they need it or, or not be afraid to ask questions, especially when there's not a defined role and it's new so that they can help create the position. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, that where I think this who, not how probably is coming from, it's like, you know, hire someone whose personality you drive with, who you enjoy speaking with and working with. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's, and, and you just have to feel into it and, and feel what's right for you because yeah. who you would hire and works well for you is different than Jared is different than me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like my, my big thing is I'd want to hire someone. Like if I were to go back to when we hired our first person back in the day, we hired an admin support and we hired a lady to come in and do some of our books, data entry processes, filing leases and stuff like that as a strong admin person. And I, I, I knew nothing about admin. I, I knew nothing about having, she was my first employee ever. And, um, you know, so there were some really tough lessons. She was very experienced. She was, you know, in her fifties, tons and tons of office experience. She got paid really, really well. And she was able to create a lot of our systems for us. Now I, I didn't have the education of running a business. Krista had some education in running a business, but nothing to the extent of where we were at. If I were to do it again, I would probably have brought in, um, you know, maybe at the time my account, cause we had a really good relationship with our account. I probably would have brought him in for some, for some guidance and some counseling. I might've, you know, hired some kind of coach or some kind of consultant to kind of guide me through the process. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, I don't, the tr you know, the reality is I don't know what I don't know. And I need to, ex I would have needed to expose those things that I didn't know. So I didn't make the mistakes that we would have made. Yeah. That's interesting. I, the, the thought to hire a coach to kind of help you understand what you don't know. That's, that's pretty critical. And I think that, yeah, obviously why you would call your accountant, like, what do they need to know? That's kind of how mm -hmm. I started when I hired my bookkeeper. Like, you know, do you have somebody, but uh, even still, like, I will say like my early experiences with, with my bookkeeper, even though my accountant referred her, um, and this, this bookkeeper isn't with me anymore, but like looking back on some of the things she had done, it was just actually the exact opposite of what I would have wanted done and the way things were done. And I was a little too hands off with it and I didn't, yeah. I didn't follow up on it. And by allowing that, when I finally did kind of take back control of my books to a certain degree, cause I got like QBO and I can actually see what's going on now. Um, I had some cleanup to do. So, <laughs> but, but that right there is a classic yeah. example of why it's not, it's, it's not, it's, it, it is the, it's not, what'd you say? Who, not how? Well, so yeah, that you, concept of who, not you, how. Yeah. You can't, you can't give someone a blank slate and say, Hey, go create it for me because your way of doing, and I'm going through this right now with my, one of yeah. my managers, 
you know, Carla sends me a text this morning. She's like, Hey, we need to start bringing you into the business yeah. decisions a little bit more. And I'm sitting there. I'm just like, yeah, you know, it is my business. This at the end of the day, it's still my business. And she's operating with the utmost integrity. I love Carla. She's operating the utmost integrity, but she's still doing it her way. Mm -hmm. And if I let it go too long, all of a sudden she's way out in right field. And yeah. I'm still at, at the pitcher at the batting cage, right? It's we got, we're too far apart. So what the correction we just put in is every Monday morning at seven 25, seven 30 in the morning, I'll show up to the office. We'll have a morning coffee. We'll do a quick check-in and talk business for an hour, mm -hmm. give her the support and guidance and love and the, the, the keep on creating the texture of the company for her. She's been with me for two, two and a half years now. She's been with me. She knows this business, but she still, we still need to keep it as yeah. my business. Right. Yeah. And that makes a lot of sense. I think that there's just a delicate balance. So this is just my take and, and what I've kind of understood because I've, I, it's worked well for me on the construction side where I have my site supervisor, cause I have a construction company. So, and I, so I have my employees on site They're they're at a distance. So I like to leave it up to say my site super, you know, how would you handle this? Like, what would you mm -hmm. do here? Um, versus with my, um, with my, uh, internals, like my bookkeeping, it's gotta be done my way. Um, there, there might be some flexibility in there. You know, I'm, I'm open to improvements and procedure, but I, it's gotta be done right. Right. There's a right and wrong way to do it. And I know some might argue, but, um, you know, if, if my accountant's going to be able to understand it and I'm going to be able to understand it, then it's gotta be done a certain way. So I just think there's like a little bit of balance needed in there. And as we've met, we've stated, you know, there's no, there's no, uh, you know, no book is 100% right. I think that there's a good ideas we can take from, from all of them, of course. Um, you know, I, I learned a long time ago, what gets inspected gets re, uh, gets respected, right? So what gets yeah. inspected gets yeah, exactly. respected. So and true. It's all about yeah. setting, you know, it's all about setting, you know, and this is what I realized, you know, just with this text from Carla, it's like, not that I'm checking up on anybody at all, yeah. but it's like, you know, it's, if you're around and, yeah. and you, you keep on checking up on it, it's like, oh, okay. And all of a sudden you start raising the bar of everyone around you that they start vibrating at a higher level because they understand your intensity. Or, or your, 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 you know, desires or your, your, your need, your way of being. And that was, that's a mistake that I've made multiple times is because I'll go hire someone and I'll check out of the company. I'm like, Oh, they got it. And then you come back a year later or a few months later, it's like, Whoa, whoa, whoa what, what just, what just happened? This isn't how I, this isn't what I, how I want it done. You know, so you got, it's, it's, you know, you got to hire the right people and, and you hire, you got to hire at the right time. You got to look at, you know, does my company, can my company support it? If I hire this person, it's going to cost me 60 grand. There goes 60 grand out of my company. If things go sideways, that's 60 grand out of my paycheck. How can I now, how do I go grow this company? How do I go expand it to support the new wage, the new family that I'm now supporting? Cause that's another responsibility as a business owner. But now how do, now what do I do with my time? How do I go back to being a visionary on the company? And hiring Carla and bringing in the people we have has allowed Chris and I to become visionaries back in the company, where in the last two years, our company has gone like that because we're back working on the business versus working in it. I love that. Yeah. I'm right. I'm right on board with you with that. And I like even just going back, I know we're all talking, we're talking about a lot of books. Yeah. It's probably also all my fault too. Uh, but for our work week, right. On the business versus in the business. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anyways, what, what were you going to say there, Krista? I was going to jump back in. I mean, this is a real estate podcast and I really think it's important to reiterate books are crucial in real estate. So having somebody doing a good job in the books is I think often overlooked. If you're an investor, I mean, Jared and I are a little different because I, he was more the out in front investor and I was sort of the admin behind the scenes, but often with Jared, he didn't understand, you know, how crucial and important being on top of your books is in real estate and, and would sort of, um, just not give it the appreciation it needed. And so, you know, if investors are listening, it's, and, and don't, I often thought, well, if someone's a professional bookkeeper. I can assume that they know more than me because I, you know, I'm self-trained entrepreneur. So that's not true. Um, they, they don't. And you just want to really reiterate, like books are so crucially important for the long term, you know, of your real estate portfolio. 
Yes, so true. And I assumed I'm like, okay, professional bookkeeper, they know how. Yeah. That's not true. No. Absolutely not no. true. Um, because real estate's a specific business. There are specific procedures we need. And if you want to apply for a loan next year and you want to be able to, yeah. to file your taxes and get audited one day because it just happens and uh, and be able to stand up to that audit and, and beat that audit, um, you got to have good books. And otherwise, yeah. like life will be absolute hell. And I'm speaking from experience yeah. here and trying to clean it up and trying to fill in the gaps. And uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. One of the hugest stressors when I kind of took back my books and had the inspection ability when I could actually look in and see what was happening. I'm like, oh my God. Uh, so that, that's why I'm so big on, I, you know, I always talk QuickBooks online so that I can see, yeah. right? I have my bookkeeper in there, but I can see everything that happens. And that's so critical to me. Uh, I don't want to be the person doing it anymore, but I always want to be able to check yeah. in and, and double check and make sure things are, are going correctly. Um, yeah. But you're right. This is a real estate podcast. And I do want to jump back into some of the intricacies of Alberta. So we've talked a lot about vision. We've talked about some nuts and bolts. Um, Alberta has been a volatile market over the last two decades. And, and you guys have seen two corrections, uh, one that took quite a while to come back from in the 2008 and now we're seeing, well, we saw another one, what, maybe three years ago? Yeah, 2016. Yeah, yeah 2016, so five years ago. Um, tell me how that's been, how, how your cash flow has changed. You know, what are some of the big takeaways that you got out of those two experiences? Uh, oh, yeah, dude, lots. Um, you know, like when we bought our first house in 2003, we had no guidance. We had no support. We were part of big, you know, real estate groups and go to rooms and listen to people talk. And it was rad. And I was one of those, I was one of those people that was up on stage in 2010. And, you know, so come to 2008, that financial recession that started like that global financial recession, it, 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 it destroyed the whole world. And we were part of that, you know, we were cash flowing extremely well leading into 2008. We had a lot of real estate. We had a lot of doors, we had a lot of cash flow, had a lot of money in the safe, so on and so on. We were all set up and I didn't understand what a recession was and, and get to 2010 when we're losing $20,000 a month and we're literally taking the last dollar bill out of the safe and putting it back in the bank to pay the bills and we're going bankrupt. You know, like that was, that was a very humbling moment and, you know, we, we just did our first podcast that we just launched and that was just, that, that was our story about what we went through. And, you know, so what we realized in 2010 was we were buying the wrong lots. We realized lots. One, our, our systems and structures weren't good. Um, you know, we kind of got complacent. And I, I guess a little bit, my ego was driving things uh, in the wrong direction. Our portfolio was not set up properly. So we were buying all the wrong properties. I was being taught to buy properties for $50 a month cash flow. Or, or for pure appreciation. Oh, and the market's going up 25, 30%. Just buy, just buy, you buy, which is what's happening in Ontario and in Vancouver right now. And, or the GTA and, and in the lower mainland. So it's very scary watching people buy for appreciation purely. That's it. Because if the market corrects and you haven't exited, you're screwed, which is what happened to us. <clears throat> so in 2010, we restructured our whole portfolio. We, one, we started up a business because I, we left our job way too soon. In 2008, we left our careers. In 2008, we left our careers to become full-time real estate investors. And, you know, I left a hundred plus thousand dollar job. Krista left her business, which was doing relatively close to that too. She was doing really well. And then what happened was as, as the market starts shifting, rent starts going down while well, I start taking pay cuts, pay cut, pay cut, pay cut, pay cut, which impacts quality of life. You impact quality of life, you impact happiness, you impact happiness, you impact relationship, you impact relationship, kids, there's wives, there's kids, there's all this other stuff, drinking shows up, blah, blah, blah. So in 2010, we reshifted our portfolio because we had to get it back into a cash flow position. We stopped refinancing properties. Every five years, we used to refinance properties. We no longer do that. Because if you refinance the property all the time, you don't actually get the mortgage pay down, which builds the spread between rent and your payment, which kind of keeps you always leveraged out. And that's not, that's just not how we want to play the game. And so, you know, so we have seen the recession, we've seen the pandemic, uh, which, well, and another recession, but then the pandemic shows up last year in March of 2020. 
And you can ask Krista, I was like on eggshells. I was shitting my pants. I didn't know. I knew my, I knew my portfolio was recession proof because I've been through two recessions. And the second one, we actually made more money than ever before. Leading into the pandemic, I really thought like, I just didn't know. Like I did, it was scary stuff. And what we've realized is all those 10 years of restructuring our portfolio has led to this pandemic that our portfolio portfolio has been able to ride it out. We're strong cash flow. We have tons of equity. Our properties are well maintained. We have low tenant turnover, blah, blah, blah. And so structuring your business properly, it doesn't matter if you're buying in Ontario or you're buying in Alberta. Alberta is not doom and gloom. It's not, it's not a volatile market. It, it's just, it's just a market. And if you play the game right, you'll have success in any market. I'm actually more fearful of people investing in Ontario right now and in the lower mainland than in Alberta. You know, like right now, interest rates are 1.7% for a five-year fixed term. Everyone and their dog is running to do these mortgages. Well, if five years from now, interest rates go to 4%, they're going to go up. You know, I don't know how much, but if they go from 1.6 to 3.6% and they double, your payment is $1,000 higher. And now you're screwed when your mortgage comes due. That, that's yeah, a I'm more point. worried about that than in Alberta. That's a good point. And uh, so I do want to touch on the interest rate. Um, what you've said is something that I've been preaching for quite some time is you don't buy for appreciation. You don't buy in Toronto for just appreciation and negative cash flow because what happens when you lose that appreciation? Mm -hmm. uh, for some people, not to not to you know look on the dark side of things here, but there are probably people who have killed themselves for a market correction when they had no cash flow, right? Like it, it is it is devastating. It can ruin their lives. Um, yeah. you know, if you own something you bought for a million bucks and it was negative cash flow, and now it's worth 500,000. Well, now you, you have a, you know, half a million dollars, Dude. you know, negative net worth maybe. And it's uh, not, e it's not even that like, go, yeah. I, I, that, that's a part of it. You know, yeah. you go to, you know, you go to Ontario, for example, or BC, we live in BC, but mm -hmm. we invest in Alberta. You go to BC, um, or Ontario and you buy a house and the market corrects. That's one part of it. But yeah. if the market corrects, rents are going to correct. Yes. So all of a sudden, rents go down. You, you're at a zero. You know, you're at a zero or a negative three hundred dollars a month cash flow position. Yeah. Rents drop, and all of a sudden, the market corrects back up. Okay. So let's say the market goes back up. Interest rates will go up. All this stuff goes up. But you can only raise rent two percent a year in yeah. Ontario or in BC. Actually, in BC, they, they're doing a rent freeze until 2022. So. You will never make that spread up at 2% rent increases when taxes are going up 9, 10, 12%. Interest rates are going to yeah. double. You know, so the cost of living goes up, milk goes up, the wages go up, da, 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 or yep. hiring trades. So you'll never make that spread if you're starting off in a negative position. And buying for appreciation, we played the game. I, mm -hmm. I, we can speak firsthand to this and we watch it all the time. It's scary stuff. Yeah, I saw a guy. I saw a guy do a Instagram, uh, some kind of Instagram live from the GTA. He's a realtor, and I was mad. Asked Chris, I did an Instagram live to rebuttal this guy. I was so mad. He's sitting there saying, "Buying, buying the GTA. Don't worry about cash flow. Buy for appreciation. You'll always win. There's a green belt going in. Buy around the green belt." I went online and I did everything I could not to say his name, and I did a 15 minute IG, yeah, Instagram live, and I like just rip this guy for saying that's the dumbest advice I've ever heard from anybody. The truth is Chris and I have a net worth of 12, $14 million is our net worth. It's, it's quite high, but you can have all the net worth you want, but you can't go buy a house. You need cash flow. You need strong numbers. You need to be in the black versus the red. That's what builds wealth. High, high, high net worth doesn't build wealth. For me, for me, wealth is having the lifestyle that I can work four or five hours a week. I can work two, two days a week. I can travel with my kids. I can be loved with my kids. I can take them to school, pick them up. I can date my wife. I can work out with my wife. That is wealth. It's not how many bills are in your, how much net worth you have. I'm with you. I don't, I mean, I've seen markets that don't go up in value. So I can't, I've seen it firsthand. I invested in, in Youngstown, Ohio. And I think that was like a learning experience for me. I knew that there are places you can go where it's not all sunshine and rainbows. And, and that advice about Toronto is just, 
it's just hoping that the worst doesn't happen. And that is a yeah. terrible business model because the worst could always happen. And if you're not prepared for yeah. it, then you'll suffer. And, and it's not, it's never real for people until they experience it themselves. And, and that's wisdom, right? You've been through two recessions. It's shaped the way you do your business. We haven't had that. It's been, it's been ridiculous in Ontario, even in 2007, 2008, it wasn't bad. Like, yeah, I think that a minor correction that was before I was really in the game, but it yeah. wasn't that it wasn't bad. Like it was where you are. And, you know, and then when, when Chris and I created this, 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 our coaching program, we got together and we're like, mm -hmm. you know, like, to be honest, there's lots of people who are coaches in real estate. They're all over the mm -hmm. place right now. And the truth is most of them haven't seen any correction. Most of them are riding this wave over, over the last five, six years where they've been, you know, I had a lady call me up the other, uh, a couple of months ago, she was just leaving her job to go full-time real estate. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what are you doing? Like, you've only been in real estate for five years. You only have six or seven or eight properties. Like, what are you doing? Oh, no, I'm making enough money that I could support my life. Well, yeah, until the market cracks. Mm -hmm. And then when the market cracks, you're completely screwed. Like, you know, like I think people should leave their, one, I don't think anyone should ever leave their job to go do full-time real estate. If you ever do, I think your income, your, your cash flow needs to be double, if not triple what your actual income is that you need to live. Because- now, if there's a shift in the market, it doesn't actually impact quality of life. It doesn't impact relationship, which Chris and I have experienced multiple times. When there's stress on the business, there's stress on the marriage. Now, yeah. when there's stress on the business, we don't have stress on our marriage. Well, I don't know. Maybe Krista can say there is stress, but but <laughs> we don't have stress on our marriage anymore because you know, we, we've separated the two and we, we've isolated both of them. Yeah. What were you doing before you were before you were uh, full time in real estate? Krista. Uh, well, I had a I had a massage therapy business, and, and um, Jared was a personal trainer. So I had okay. some therapists that worked for me, and and so the beginning of our of our journey, I had that, and he was full time training. So it was busy. Okay. Well, it's, it's not even that. Like at the beginning of our journey, like Krista was rich dad mentality. I was poor dad mentality. You know, re referencing yeah. rich dad, poor dad, Robert Kiyosaki book. And, you know, like Krista came from an entrepreneurial family, farmers, they had buys and they, they were ranchers, they had grain, they, were, they, they had a nestle station, you know, they were very entrepreneurial. My, my, my upbringing was, you know, my dad was an accountant, my mom was a stay at home mom, Phenom both sets of parents were phenomenal, they did a great job with us, but we just had different mindsets. So when Krista came up to, uh, to me back in 2003, and she's like, you know, I want to go to this workshop. And it was a rain workshop, real estate investment network back in 2003. And I'm like, no, I don't want to go. Like, why would I go to that? Well, I want to, I want to get into real estate. I'm like, fuck that. I don't want real estate. I had zero interest in doing real estate. And Krista takes us to this workshop and she's the one that signed us up for this program. She's the one that bought us the membership. I was right pissed off about it. We couldn't afford it. You know, it's not like, excuse me. It's not like we got into this business with, hundreds of thousands of dollars or we inherited a portfolio like we built it literally from scratch i think we had maybe 15 grand to our to our name to buy real estate so when people come and say oh, i i got no money i can't do it or i you know i got no time i can't that's all bullshit their why is not clear enough their desire to achieve it is not is not great or strong enough you know so that's how we got into real estate. I had zero interest in being a real estate person. It was about Krista wanting to be a mom and having a retirement because yeah. we had zero pension. We had no, we had no, you know, what if fund. We had no structure of what happens when we're 60 years old. I wasn't thinking like that because I was still in party mode. Krista was in, you know, like let's entrepreneurial. She was like, let's, let's plan for this. Let's think about this. Mm -hmm. And real estate, she ended up listening to a guy named Terry Pranich. She's a realtor out of Edmonton to do a, do a talk. And she's like, yeah, real estate could be our vehicle. And, you know, fast forward 18, 19 years, you know, it's, it's a pretty rad vehicle. Well, yeah, I mean, conceptually, it, it, I just don't get why people don't get into real estate. Obviously it's not taught in school, <laughs> but conceptually it makes no sense why people go to like, totally. and, I, and I'm not trying to say there's anything wrong with stocks. There's absolutely nothing wrong with stocks. A lot of people make a lot of money there, but you can't leverage uh, you know, yeah. 80%, typically most people can't, some people can, I'm not saying all, but I mean, the average person is not going to go out and leverage 80% of their stock portfolio and they're not going to make cash flow off of it the way you do in yeah. real estate. So, I mean, I think just, the, just the leverage and the appreciation, although we don't bank on it the way it's been happening, I mean, with inflation and what have you, 
um, you know, it just, it's just the obvious choice for me. It was, uh, I think that, and, and I'm curious if, if, if you had the similar moment, but I mean, I look back at the way my parents did things and I just looked at that. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. I need to find a better way. And I think that that led me to where I am or where I ended the path I went down. Did, mm-hmm. was that similar? I guess, Jared, maybe not for you. Cause you weren't really thinking that, uh, but Krista, was that what kind of had you thinking this, or did you have a, something you were trying to overcome, or was it just about, you know, being able to raise a family and be free? Uh, well, I was really fortunate because I, I, I had a lot of inspiration from my parents, both with, with how they did things and the mindset they taught me. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, my parents really taught me to not, not um, you know, to, to be in control of myself, I guess, take control of my financial future. So they were teaching me to not rely on a boss or a, or a, a yeah. job. And also they were in multi-level marketing things. Okay. And so we got exposed to lots of, um, you know, thinking big and, and I don't know if you've had much to do with them, but the, what's great about multi-level marketing is they generally have a lot of really great growth things built in, yeah. whether, you know, books yeah, the and motivational speakers. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so I got, you know, I don't, they didn't really do it intentionally. They were just doing their thing in life of, of trying to get ahead and, but in the meantime, I was being programmed with that as normal. And yeah, so that just was normal to me to want to grow and expand. Right. You know, and, then, and, then, and then we started dating in 2000. And then when we started dating, Chris's parents were in Amway, which was uh, at that time, it was probably the biggest multi-level marketing in the country, in the world. And like, we would go to workshops, you know, like this is what I tell clients all the time, like buying real estate's easy. It's believing you can do it. It's the hard part. It's believing and trusting that you will succeed at it is what stops most people from a, from taking action. It's the start that stops most people because buying a house is easy. Anyone can do it for the most part. And we would go to these conventions, these workshops, and there would be at, at, at Rexall, which is where the Oilers played back then. It was called uh, uh, Skyreach Center or whatever. But there would be like 15,000 people in this, in this venue. And there were motivational speakers and we were listening to like Tony Robbins, and Zig Ziglar and all these, all this stuff. And it was just like, it was like reprogramming your brain to be able to go off and take it to, to take action to get a result. And, you know, so my programming as a child was different than Krista's. The Krista was naturally taught all this stuff from her parents. My, my parents didn't teach me that. It wasn't until I joined this multi-level marketing and started dating Chris where I was exposed to mindset. And it's funny because I played hockey. I, I made, you know, I got drafted and I, I, I had a cup of coffee with the Maple Leafs, the Oilers. And, you know, I was, I was clear on, on determination and drive and hard work, but the mindset was a little bit of a, you know, a lacking component of, of my growth, which really got exposed in 2000 to 2003 in these multi-level marketings. The point of all this that we're sharing is I think the, I think the struggle that a lot of people have is the mindset of it, you know, and people will read a real estate book and after real estate book, after real estate book, after real estate book, but they won't actually go read self-help or personal development books because they think I just got to learn how to buy real estate. That's, that's not it. You know, you can go, you can go have two conversations with somebody and they'll tell you how to buy a house, but it's, it's rewiring your hardware, which is your brain and your heart to be able to believe that you can achieve a result. That's yeah, that's really good uh, advice. And I got onto it. Um, I went to a real estate conference back in like 2010, late 2010. And that's when the personal development kick started for me. And I, I read a sales book and, it, you know, in a sales book, I think it was a Brian Tracy book. He's just like, make your home a university on wheels or your car mm-hmm. a university on wheels. And then I was just always listening to every single audiobook I could, I could get my hands on. And it was like, you know, think and grow rich and all that stuff. And I just filled my brain with that. Um, oh. grateful for that because I question things in a way that I don't think the average person does. And I think that helped me to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, yeah, I think, I, I can think that can't be stressed enough. A lot of people are in this solely for real estate, but if you do want to grow big, you have to have big vision, which I, I think this, this episode is really good for, cause we're talking about vision. We're talking about not so much the nuts and bolts. Those are important, but I mean, I've got a lot of that on this podcast. It's uh, it's really great to see kind of, you know, bigger picture. How do we how do we think the way we need to think in order to grow big, right? Cause you're over a hundred properties, pretty big net worth numbers. You're talking about, you guys are just here cause you want to be, you're not here cause you need to be. 
And, like, uh, and look, I'm going to put this, I'm going to put this in a different perspective, mm-hmm. you know, like who you are today. So say, say there's a, uh, you know, a 28 year old, 30 year old couple listening to this or a single doesn't really matter. They're listening to this and they want to, they have aspirations to go off and build, you know, a $10 million real estate portfolio and who they are today. If they don't evolve and sharpen their skills and keep on continuing to sharpen, sharpen themselves up, sharpen themselves up and grow and expand their mentality and their consciousness, who they are today. If they are that person in 20 years, when they have $10 million, why do you think most NFL players, most professional athletes are broke four years after they're done playing football or hockey or soccer or baseball It's because they actually don't evolve as a person. So now they're just this person from 10 years ago with $10 million. Yeah. And there's, there's, they're, they're not in alignment. So now, you know, Chrissy, you can jump in on this too, because you'll have lots to say on this, on how I showed up as, as a person with money, because I never evolved. I never, I never sharpened my skills. I never learned awareness and consciousness. I never learned love. I never learned how to expand my mind and my heart and my soul. I was never able to, to tie into my gut feeling. It was just always, I'm going to go do this, 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 this. So fast forward 10 years later, when we have money, I'm still who I was when I, mentality when I was 24 years old, I was living in ego. I never actually evolved. Scary stuff. You know, what comes to mind is I think in some ways it's a little easier for women to do this work in that men, there, there tends to be a little more ego involved and it's harder to be vulnerable and open about, you know, what you're feeling and your challenges and struggles. And so watching Jared and, you know, he'll, he'll be the first to say this. It, he he didn't necessarily have someone to turn to to say like I'm going through all of these struggles and stresses and and challenges, um you know it's tough that you, as a guy there's this perception you have to have it all together I think that's shifted and changed and probably even I don't even know how old you are Andrew but like your generation I think you're a bit younger than us yeah um, mid, early mid thirties yeah 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 you, you know it's even better for you than it than it was for say Jared's age but. Um, it's, and things are coming along where this is getting easier, but the, mm. yeah, that comes to mind when you talk about that. Jared. Okay. I want to shift, uh, shift gears uh, and just, cause Eric, or sorry, right before we got on here, Jared, you were mentioning that, uh, that you did have some uh, thoughts and opinions on the current situation. I'm just curious, obviously we've got, uh, we still have rolling lockdowns, um, you know, happening right now, uh, as of our recording of this. What's your thought to investors? I mean, my personal you know, concern is with the inflation the issue that we've got coming. I, I, I don't see a, a very well-balanced approach. I'm curious what your take is um, on this. Yeah, you know, like I, I've bought in hot markets. I've bought in down markets. I've bought in pretty much everything. And I've always believed this is something taught by a guy named Terry Pranich is, is if you're always buying, you know, there's ne- ne- you know, there's never a high, there's never a low. You're always right in the middle, right? Mm-hmm. And I think right now with interest rates, I think like I'm very fearful that people are buying purely for appreciation, which is happening. And it's, it's a scary game to play because in five years, I think we're seeing more renters right now turning into homeowners just because it's now for the first time I've ever seen in uh, 19 years of investing, it's now cheaper to own a property to, or for a tent or for a renter to go into the market of buying than it is to actually pay rent. And what's scary is, you know, 93 or 94 cents out of every dollar in the lower mainland or in Ontario goes to personal living, personal living costs. So now you fast forward five years from now and interest rates go up, even if it's seven years from now, if interest rates go up, we're going to have some problems. And I think that's when the, that's when we're going to see a massive course correction. I think we're going to see, we potentially could see foreclosures through the roof in five, six years when all these mortgages come due because wages are not going up, you know, cost of living is going up. All these costs are going up, but your income is going to stay flat right now. Like unemployment nationally is 10%. You know, it's going to take years to, to reduce employment. You know, we ran an ad for a new employee uh, out of Edmonton and we had something like a hundred and something apps come in for this. Like it was insane. So I really feel that right now is the better, you know, there's, there's an opportunity to make a ton of money right now in real estate. If you're buying in the right markets, you know, I think people really need to pay attention to Alberta, you know, oil's creeping up. No one's talking about oil. Nobody's talking about oil. The U S Biden's come in, whereas Trump was, uh, 
uh, pro-America, pro-America, let's make America independent. Whereas Trump has, or Biden's come in and slashed all that stuff. And now Biden's going to have to become dependent on all these other co- countries again for oil. So you got to start watching oil. Oil starting to creep up to 61, 62, $63 a barrel. Well, in this last pandemic, or in this last downturn, which is the pandemic, oil companies can now pull oil out of the ground for like $14, $15 a barrel. Like they're pulling it out so, so like very cost effective that their margins are there. So if you start looking at opportunity, you start looking at, you know, GDP growth, gross domestic product, you start looking at interest rates, you start looking at the land. I really feel that people should be investing in areas where they understand the rules of the game. The rules of the game are dictated by the Landlord and Tenant Act. The Landlord and Tenant Act in BC and Ontario say that you can only raise rents 2% a year. In Alberta, it's unlimited. So as the market starts shifting up, because the economy starts turning, my rents will go from $1,500 a month to $2,500 a month with 90 days notice. They'll just pop right up. I don't have to, uh, there's no restrictions. There's also no land transfer tax in Alberta. So if you start looking at the rules of the game of Alberta, this is why I'm pro-Alberta. But if you start looking at the rules of the, of the game, they're very favorable in Alberta. I just see a lot of opportunity for, you know, Alberta right now. Like I'm pro Alberta and versus, cause I'm all about buying for cash flow versus buying for appreciation. And I'd rather keep a property for 15 years and make a thousand dollars a month than have a property and hope to make $150,000 of appreciation that I can never get out or it's risky to get out. Yeah. Well, and it's speculative. To me, totally. it's not a guarantee. So for me, it's always got to be cash flow too. I'm right there with you. And I think Alberta is a fantastic opportunity right now. I, I mean, definitely with oil coming back up, that's great. I mean, I don't love it, but I think it's just, it represents an extreme level of affordability across the country, um, you know, compared mm-hmm. to Ontario. I think that there's going to be a lot of people that that want to go see if they can find a job in Calgary or Edmonton totally. because their dollar can go a lot further there. And well, cost of living, like you, you can come buy a house in Alberta for $500,000 that that house in Ontario or in the GTA is one, 1.2, 1.3, yeah. you know, like, you know, cost of living, something like 50 something cents of your dollar in Alberta goes to cost of living. The other, so now you can come to Alberta. You, you got to make a hundred grand in Ontario in the GTA. You can make 60 grand in, in Alberta and mm-hmm. still have the same quality of life. You know, it's colder. There's bigger mosquitoes, blah, blah, blah. Like there is a different <laughs> climate in Alberta versus the GT and the lower mainland. But, but ultimately, if you start looking at, you know, if you start, just start tracking oil, start, and I'm not, you, you can hate oil, you can love oil. I'm not, I'm not saying like, I'm personally, I'm for oil, but as far as opportunity, that's the number one indicator. However, the reverse can be said as oil starts dropping, the province starts separating, like it starts splitting up, people mm-hmm. move home and home isn't around the corner. Home is on, is in Ontario. Which means if you start playing the game right and you're buying the right properties with the strong cash flow, legally suited houses, for example, you know, those are going to give you the longevity to be able to ride out a downturn because Alberta will go up and it will go down, but it's not as sharp as people think. It's not boom, tank, boom, tank. It's like, it's just like a nice flow up, you know, but you still have to play the game strategically that when it's in a lull and oil is $40 or $50, you're going to be fine. Most people don't think like that because they're yeah. speculative and they jump in when it's too too late and it's hot. Well, let's go buy when it's hot. But it makes sense. Yeah. Well, that's all the FOMO. People just don't want to miss out. Yeah, so they, they totally. want to get in and uh, and it's a mistake, you know, just getting in for the sake yeah. of getting in. That's, you know, it's what I did early on and I, I paid for it dearly. So, I mean, yeah, I think, it's like, I th- it's like Bitcoin. Look what's going on with Bitcoin. You know, like <laughs> Bitcoin's now $64,000 and it peaked at $72,000 last week or something like mm-hmm. that. You know, like there's people that are now scrambling to go buy. I, listen, I don't, I don't own stocks. I don't do Bitcoin. I don't, I don't have an opinion of it. But, but I look at all these people rushing because Elon Musk went and bought 1.5 billion dollars yeah. worth of Bitcoin. So now they're all rushing. Oh my God, I'm gonna miss out. I'm gonna miss out. Well, come on. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I buy purely for cash flow. Yeah, no, I, and I'm right with you there. Um, you know, having studied economics, I don't, I don't love the fundamentals of Bitcoin. I think it's, a, it's an attempt at a solution to fiat mm-hmm. currency, which I really don't like. I, I think that our, our government's being very irresponsible right now. Um, 
and you know, Bitcoin is an attempt to try and say, well, Hey, this is better because they can't just print the money. Um, mm -hmm. but it, you know, it lacks the fundamentals and I know I, I take people off when I say these things, but, uh, Hey, it's, it's my opinion. So it's your, it's, and it's your podcast. You can say whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. And, I get asked and, about it a lot and I have the same response every time. You know what? I think you can make money on it. doesn't mean I'm going to do it. And yeah. uh, I think we all have to be very real about that. There's certain things that meet fundamentals and certain things that don't, you can make money in all of it, but what are yeah. you going to be okay with when things go bad? And I think that that's, yeah. um, that's the big thing there. So, uh, one interesting point just to note here. So in the States, you can have 30 year mortgages that are a 30 year fixed rate here in, you know, in Canada, you have a five year fixed rate on a 30 year amortization you are right that that is absolutely what happens. Our government has the ability to manipulate the price yeah. of the bond yield. And by man manipulating the bond yield, they can drive interest rates up. And so say we were renewing and in at like 1980s rates at 20%, how many people would lose their houses? Our, no, our government even, dude, has the ability to do that. It's, you know, it's, it's like, look at look, the bond rate just went crazy a couple of days ago and, and, and the fixed rates went up. Like the bond rate doesn't impact the variable rate or, or the prime lending rate. It'll in fact impact your fixed rate. Well, yeah, indirectly it will over time, Correct. but yeah. So, so Correct. prime lending rate, yeah, that, that will get changed over time, but it, it all really starts with the bond yield and fixed rates are set Correct. based on a spread on bond yield too. Right. Totally. So like the bond rate started going gate shit a couple of days ago. So interest for fixed term rates went up. So you got to look at what's going on right now is like Canada has a, what, $2 trillion debt or whatever it is. It's crazy amounts of debt. So, there, you know, the, the Bank of Canada has already come out and said interest rates aren't moving. Like it's going to be like, they're going to be low for the foreseeable future. They mm -hmm. have to keep them low because if they go up one point, mm -hmm. that interest payment to, to the government is detrimental. It's going to, it's going to, it's going to destroy the country. The yeah. country's already destroyed because of what the federal government's doing. That's my, that's my, I share that opinion with you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so, you know, so, so the fixed, the variable rates will stay low for a couple of years. The fear though, is outside of three years, outside of two, the next two years out past that, that's scary. Yeah. And I really feel like, I don't think, I don't know if interest rates will go to 20%. They could, but yeah. if they go from 2% to 4%, that will cripple the economy. Yep. And, you know, the, people will have to understand, like we're running, a, I think I, they just, I just read there was a $250 billion deficit in the federal government. Um, they have to make that money back somehow, you know, like they have to, and they're going to raise taxes. They're going to yeah. raise, you know, I was meeting with a, a couple of clients, part of our coaching program, we bring clients into Kelowna. We do this deep dive, this one day with this one day breakdown uh, of everything. And this couple that we were working with, they have RSPs and, and I'm like, okay, hey, what's the point of RSPs? And they have the ability to go acquire 15, 20 properties. And so I'm like, what's, what's the point of the RSPs? Well, I say tax. Well, that's cool. So right now your household income is $140,000 say, what is your household income going to be in 15 years? Significantly more than $140,000. So those RSPs now don't make sense. Because you're saving tax today at a lower tax bracket than you will tomorrow at a higher tax bracket. So when you go to cash those out in 10 years, you're going to be paying more tax. You're only making 4% return on those RSPs. So let's go take the crystallize those, pay the tax, go buy a house where you're making mortgage pay down of $10,000 plus appreciation of $15,000 at 3%. So now you're going to make like 17% return on your money year over year. So, you know, so you got to start looking the whole, the whole world, you got to start watching returns on stocks, returns on investments. You got to start watching interest rates because in five years, like there could be some scary, scary stuff coming. Yeah, I think, so. I think you're right. Um, you know, and I could, I could listen to you talk and we could have this conversation for a long time because <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, I think that, um, you know, in crisis, all bets are off the table. And I, I think that there is, and not to be uh, doom and gloom, I'm, that's not my intent. I think we need to prepare ourselves and we need to position our portfolios accordingly. But if a crisis mm -hmm. were to happen, the, well, we can't, we can't raise interest rates because it will hurt people. It'd be like, well, guys, the currency's going crazy. We're, our inflation's going crazy. I know we can't do it, but we gotta. And then totally. they do something that would just you know, you, you would never, I mean, if we look back one year, we would say the government could never justify doing what they yeah. have done today. You know, as of today, we're in March now of 2021. Um, 
we would never have thought you told somebody one year from today, you know, I go today, what was going to be happening yeah. right now. They would have said, not a chance. You're, you're kidding me. Double mask. Yeah. Oh, come on. Yeah. <laughs> you not know, sit, lock your kids in their room for two weeks because they tested positive for something. No, come on. People are smarter than that. Yeah. Uh, no, no. So, you know, this is the thing, like we can't trust uh, that type of thing. We have to trust our own instincts. So yeah. I- I'm with you there. I, I think that we- we've all got to make really smart decisions um, not to over leverage or at least, you know, make sure we have extremely strong cash flow uh, and yeah. that we believe in the, you know, the current value of our asset is higher than we're buying for it, things like that. So I'm looking actually you know, down here in Florida right now, because I see yeah. some, some better value, a lot better value for the, uh, for the dollar spent. You know, but and all that, dude. I, I would, I would also say, you know, now is probably the, the the best time ever to be taking guidance from somebody. Mm-hmm. You know, like you got you got to be careful with the big groups. You go to a big group; they're they're putting people up on stage for thirty minutes at a time. Which the big groups are gone now for the most part; they're all online. But listening to a speaker for 30, 40 minutes, you know, you don't get enough of the real juice to determine if that's the right play or not. So you have to be very, very careful. So right now, if you start watching social media, there's so much stuff on social media that if you follow the wrong advice going forward over the next five years, like you, there's some potential to lose everything. Yeah. And now's the time more than ever to be able to follow people who've done it, follow people who have achieved it, follow people who have made the mistakes and corrected it. And because I really feel there's huge opportunity to be made. There's so much like if, if, you know, I tell clients all the time that this is actually the best time I've ever seen in investing out of all my years of investing. There's just so much opportunity from interest rates to cash flow to uh, house values from future appreciation to long-term growth and mortgage pay down. Mm-hmm. Like the quality of property you can buy today versus back in the day. Like it's just, everything's different. Tenant profiles are different. Tenants wants are different. Tenants affordabilities are different. Yeah where there's some real opportunity if you play the game properly and you don't get caught in the trap of, I want to retire in in two years or in three years. I, I'm going to make all this appreciation off this house. Like those are grand slams. If you play the game for singles and doubles every single day, you will win the game. You don't win games off of grand slams that happen once every 30 games. Okay. So real quick, cause we're, we're running on here. So what's a single <laughs> to you? Give me like just very high level back of the envelope single. Like what yeah, are you buying? Yeah. What's it, what's it right for a single, a single, like a single hit. You mean like a single yeah. play or a, yeah, so no, like, a, yeah, not a home run. It's a single, like yeah, what's yeah. a single in, so in Alberta. So, so, so I'll give you this definition. A single to me would be like a house with 500, 550 cash flow. Okay. So, so what's that buy for? I'm, what's it rent for? So you'd buy that for about 460,000, 450,000, and it's going to rent for about $3,000 a month. The suited houses. Everything I do is suited houses. 450 okay. to get a suited house. So total rent, three, 3,000. Yeah. And you think there's upward mobility and say maybe a year or two, if, if things get a lot better in Alberta, you can jack those rents. Yeah. Like as, as rates go up. So back in the yeah. day, if you were to go back, to, uh, back in 2016, these houses were cash flowing about a thousand to fifteen hundred dollars a month. Now they cash flow five hundred because rents have corrected a little bit. Yeah. A double, a double is you're going to pay about four seventy five, four eighty. It's going to cash flow you about a thousand dollars a month. It's going to be completely renovated top to bottom with all your long term furnaces, roofs, windows, all the long term maintenance is going to be taken care of. So that to me would be a double. Uh, grand slam would be. You know, you buy a house for, you know, three hundred thousand dollars. You're able to suite it, renovate it, and sell it for five hundred. Mm-hmm. So that's the grand slam, which every all these wholesalers are looking for these grand slams, and they they miss out on all these yeah. opportunities. When all I do is play for singles and doubles. So I'll go buy a house for three thirty, renovate it, sell it for four eighty. So I make less profit, but I do fifteen of them. You know, mm-hmm. they're looking for one. They're looking for a needle in a haystack. So those would be my singles, doubles, and grand slams analogy. Um, but at the end of the day, always play for cash flow. You'll always win. You will always win if you play for cash flow and you always have it. Because yep. if the market corrects, you just hold it a little bit longer. Yeah, you just hang tight. You can't hang tight if you're bleeding money like crazy. Sometimes you got to sell and then you realize your loss. And that's the, that's the main reason not to do it. Um, okay, this has been really interesting. Uh, where do we send people if they want to learn more about you, connect with you? Uh, so Krista, you can follow Krista on, on Instagram, which is K hope five. Um, I'm the Jared hope on all handles, uh, on all platforms. 
we have our coaching business, which is Jared and Krista, which is our handles and then jkcoaching.ca. And then we also have a property investment business out of Alberta, out of Edmonton called Tilt Property Group. Uh, so tiltgroup.ca, where we help investors get into cash flowing properties. We have property management. We help them renovate. We help with burrs. We help with all that stuff. And then our big thing right now is our coaching program, which is the jkcoaching.ca, where we just really want to teach people everything we know to, for them to have a successful, well-balanced, happy life. Yeah. That, no, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I can really appreciate that. So, um, as far as the products go for you, like, are, do you have investors that are coming out there and just, you know, contacting you and saying, I want to put this money to work, find me something yeah. or, or sell me something. Is that, was that what's typically happening? Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I probably get a couple calls a month where they're like, Hey, I want to, you know, I want to be your partner. I want to invest with you. And you know, my reply back is that's, that's great. That's awesome. But let me just show you how to do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so we'll get them all set up and I'll take them instead of being a 50 fit, which is a huge win for me. But the truth is I don't really want any more joint venture partners. I'm trying to buy out my remaining joint venture partner. And so we have the product and I'll have the systems that if someone calls, I'll put them into the right product for them to go acquire it. Mm -hmm. And we have the management, and all that stuff in place. You know, we'll also have help, help someone find a house to renovate for example, and then they can hire us to renovate it if they want, or they can outsource their own crews to do yeah. renovations. So Tilt is kind of like a one-stop shop for real estate investors. So you and, have the properties with Tilt properties you've renovated, yeah. you can sell it to them, you can manage it for them, yeah. all that. Yeah. You know, so if, if you have a, if there's a listener, for example, who has five properties or two properties in Alberta and they need property management, I have a management division. I have a collections division. I have a realtor division. I have a renovation division. You know, so we have all these divisions that support real estate investing in, t in its entirety. Awesome. Okay. It sounds like you're busy. You got, you got <laughs> lots on the go. You're doing it all. So yeah, yeah that's great. I'll, I'll make sure those links are in the, in the show notes of the episode. And I really want to thank you both for, for taking the time to do this. I think it's, uh, it's been a really interesting conversation. Yeah. Thanks buddy. Good luck. Yeah. Thanks, you too. Well, hopefully we can stay in touch now. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Thanks for tuning in to today's episode. Please make sure to share this episode far and wide. Help it help more people. I really appreciate you tuning in. Thanks. I'll see you on the next one. Mm -hmm.